welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. I'm Molly Herford, and when not writing about all things outdoors related, I'm doing most things outdoors related. And I'm Peter Glassford. I'm a registered kinesiologist and an endurance coach. I think that's the shortest little intro I've done for myself in a while. I was going to say, but I often interrupt my intro, so I tried to keep it tight on this one, and uh, yeah, we're, we're through that. So. All right, go team. Where have you been in the last week, my wife? How, where have you been? <laughs> you don't even know. Um, I no, was. It's very hard to keep up with you. I know, I know. Uh, our poor parents. Um, I was in New Jersey for, actually, no, I'm lying. I was in Ontario, and I was coaching my cross-country high school team. We had our pre-provincials championship race like the championship for the county basically um regionals regionals there we go i was so excited a lot of the kids did had like career best races um one of the one of the kids came up and he like told me about his pre his whole plan for the race how he was going to go out and i thought it was a really good plan and watching you know a 16 year old have a plan that involved him being kind of towards the back at the beginning not going crazy at the start Uh, And actually then executing on it and finishing, I think, sixth or seventh was super cool. I mean, I think that's something that I see a lot of adults incapable of doing, right? When the group is going ahead of you, there's that panic of like, oh my God, I need to be up there. I need to be in the mix. But he just stayed super calm, just, you know, chugged along, caught up, just executed beautifully. It was awesome. Yeah, I mean, that's cool, right? When you can see that sort of, I had a very philosophical conversation with a a new client on the phone yesterday. I was walking in the forest, so it was quite good, but he was quite taken by mountain biking and its relation to life and how you Mm. had to stay focused and it was a great way to meditate. But if you go too slow or too fast or, you know, only look directly in front of you and don't plan for the future, you would get into trouble, but you couldn't only look into the, the, the future. You had to look in the, what was happening now. And Zen in the art of mountain biking. So all that to say, there's a lot of things that transfer from sport, and I think that's part of the reason we do it, right? Mm-hmm. So for this young person, it might be that, you know, he planned out a strategy and saw how it worked. And it's a hard strategy to have, have, though. Don't have to go with the crowd all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there you go. You don't have to be the leader all the time. Like, so to paint the picture for this, just because like I'm so impressed by this, the course is two laps of this first little kilometer long loop, and there's you know a moderate hill in it, and it none of it is single track; it's all quite open, and because there's you know 150 of these guys starting, the tendency is in that first hundred meters, 200 meters, everyone just goes bananas. So we're talking about a field of 150. And he was, I think, third from last, hitting the first little riser. So, like, the part that everyone is watching and cheering, it's where all the tents are, it's where all the teams are set up, so everyone sees you do this part. Mm -hmm. So, to be able to resist the urge to just sprint and burn a couple matches because everyone is cheering and the race just started, I thought was so mature. And then, you know, by loop two, he was mid-pack, and then, you know... By the end of the race, he'd worked his way into sixth. Yeah, and it's funny with something like a cross-country running race, too. You know, there's a lot of ability to pass. Yeah. So, you know, it doesn't... Mountain biking, there's actually a study that has been performed and it's searchable on PubMed that start position is quite correlated with um, finish position. Now, there's a few variables because the fastest people usually also have the best start position. Yeah. But mountain biking is obviously, you know, it's a race to the single track. And then totally. there, there's a funneling down of your 150, right? Yeah, this is absolutely not a strategy that works for every race and every situation. Well, and if those were two laps to start of 1K, right? Like that's 2K, people will start fading pretty hard. So if you had a 2K run, you know, where everyone's sort of in a pack and you're at the back of the pack, you know, if people start fading too, and yeah, it's an okay strategy, right? Yeah, and then he had another 3K after that 2K. Yeah, and next time he could certainly start mid-pack, right, and just not be so stressed or, you know. There, there's the strategy of starting at the back could mean just, you know, in mountain biking we often look at you're, you have a group, and so I did this at Provincials, which I won, but you just sit 
you know, sixth or whatever. And then as the gaps open, you just keep filling those gaps. So it takes a few efforts here and there to like go around the people who are fading, mm-hmm. but you sit in and you draft and you don't make those big aggressive attacks. You just keep covering and covering. And then eventually it's you at the front, hopefully, and, totally. you, and you win. This has happened about twice in my life. Yeah. Um, but that you're winning could be anything for this young gentleman. It, that six was probably the best of his life. Right? It was huge. Yeah. I mean, that's, so, it got him to now our provincial. So what he would have to watch then, I guess, is just in that 150, if you start seeing a ballooning of that last 50 splitting, he may have to go around that last 50 group of people yeah, totally. to get into that group of a hundred. And then you're, you're going to keep just sort of continuing your pace and going around and going around. Right. And, yeah, it sounds that sounds like very good. In addition to his success with pacing, I'd also point out I think he was the only guy in the field to wear little marathon gloves. Oh, that's I mean that, that was, was his kid. competitive yeah. advantage. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I was super impressed. He, you know, shorts like singlet, marathon gloves. I was like, this kid is going to do amazing, yeah. and he did. Yeah, no, those are important things to have. Those they're essentially just one size fits all gloves. Yeah. yeah. Let me tell you, and I'm working on an article about this though. I was eavesdropping a little bit on a conversation as some kids were watching one of the races. And I'm very worried about the state of sports nutrition amongst the youth. There was one kid who had three hours till his race who was like sucking down a gel. Like, okay, that's, that's not a thing. Um, but it's something I also see adults doing. This is not like only teenagers do stuff like this. And then he's telling his friend, he's like, yeah, so I had a... Uh, I had a protein shake for breakfast and a cliff bar. And I was like, man, your race is at 3 p.m. You could have a normal human breakfast. Right. And then the other guy was like, oh, well, that's, that's good. But I had a lot of pasta last night mm-hmm. with butter. I was like, okay. So we still have some nutrition misinformation that's out to the, the youths. Um, uh, I mean, I remember we had all sorts. So we still have like only pasta and we bought this like carbo boom so we could have extra carbohydrate on top. So we were like drinking these uh-huh. like, it basically was like weight gainer powder. And I remember us drinking that like the day before with tons of pasta and then probably like vector cereal as well. Like, I mean, I think young people can absorb a fair bit. I know, of... but when your race is 5k, have yeah. a breakfast. Yeah, I mean, you, they probably don't need a ton, but they got to eat something. At least they're eating something, I guess. Well, I think it's just interesting, though. Like, they were saying this in this certainty that they were doing the right thing for sports nutrition. Such as youth, I guess. I know, I know. But so, same with adults, though, right? Like, And I mean, I'll say my nutrition stuff has changed over the last 10 years. Stuff that I believed 10 years ago is, you know, proven to be incorrect now. So well, it does change, yeah, but... and I mean, I guess ultimately, if they don't vomit, like it's always, I always say, did you win or did you vomit? And then there's some place in between there, so just sort of undulate, right? So, yeah. So if you're anyway. if you're winning, you can do whatever you want. Yeah, if you're, fair you know, enough. if you're, and winning again is we're going to get into this, but it's your version of winning. So if you're getting the results you want, then it's probably not something to look at. Sure. But I mean, if you're having severe GI distress and you know, or yeah. vo- or vomiting at the extreme level. Fair enough. Then there's, you know, you probably don't want to have a gel on empty stomach while you're not moving. But yeah, maybe that person digests that stuff really well. Absolutely. He was wearing a cape. So Hmm. by the way, I love high school cross country. I'm so bitter that I didn't do it. It seems really awesome. The people seem amazing. So that is my cross country thing. Then I headed back to New Jersey. I was in Vermont this weekend at uh, Rasputitsa's Bittersweet Women's Event. Gave my uh, my TED talk on athlete identity in a very chilly theater with a bunch of other amazing women. Got to hang out with Georgia Gould and Leah Davison. Had a super awesome time. Had a freezing cold gravel ride. Um, wore every layer that I owned and was still very chilly, but had an absolute blast. So yeah, a really good event. And then I hit three snowstorms coming home. So I am disliking this time of year a lot. Very good. Yeah, that's an exciting <laughs> <end>. week. Yeah. <laughs> How about you? Where were you? 
Uh, we were in Moab, which was good. We did a bit of mountain biking, uh, sort of a retirement party for a good friend and longtime supporter as well. So that was good. And he had always wanted to go back to Moab. So we went and rode and uh, he really enjoyed it. his time. He's still down there. So hope that's continuing for him. And then I rushed back and one of my longtime best friends is getting married. So we did a, I guess a bachelor's party is what you call it. It was more of a cottage weekend where we drank coffee and a um, couple adult beverages, but uh, mostly it was coffee and uh, yeah, but it was a lot of good people that, you know, brought together, which doesn't happen a lot in adult life. Mm-hmm. They have a bunch of really, really good friends together. So yeah, quite relaxing. And then we had snow at a uh, Ontario cottage. So lake house. I feel like you had like the really nice version of the snow and then I had like the garbage version of yeah, the snow. Yeah, it was quite nice. And I'm the person that always wakes up early and does stuff. So I was up early and sort of had that like misting over the water dock with snow and the snow had covered all the branches of the trees. So it was quite lovely. At the same time, I was waking up in our van, having slept in a rest area, you had those mid 10 hour drive. Froze, frozen windows and so forth. Frozen windows, frozen nose, frozen toes. It's great. Right. Well, let's get into it. So, we have a couple more questions this week. Thank you for your submissions on that. By all means, uh, there's a contact form at consummateathlete.com if you ever have a question or you can sort of message or DM or whatever people do on social media. You can send those to Molly. <laughs> not not you yeah and Peter's on a social media fast right now well I've grayscaled my phone and locked it down with the new operating system so I have a very high-tech phone that's basically useless at the moment and I can't figure out how to get it off a of grayscale so it's a pretty good solution great yep insta insta paper instagram is quite uh I'm really nervous about any photos you post of me going forward. It's just so boring in black and white. So you're just like, "Eh, I don't need this. So anyhow, search grayscale on your phone if you want to lock it down. It's pretty sweet. Uh, If you'd have any important function you have to do in your life, though, that involves color, I would advise against that because it confuses you on what is good and bad if you have things you have to do. All that to say, one of the questions today, which one are we starting with? The, the, the The why. So we have, you know, and I have a few clients in this this boat, I guess, you know, there's this transition in life where you're, you know, elite at something or, or aspiring to be elite or pro, uh, you know, world championships and stuff, that point B, that end point goal is fairly obvious. Uh, and then, and you know, at some point you're off that curve and it becomes apparent that you're not going to be the world champion or go to the Olympics, right? And we, we have to deal with this at some point. And whether that's because of like an actual like, okay, you're just not racing at that level or just life starts taking over, right? You're done with university, you get your first, you know, real job, you have kids, you're in a relationship where that just doesn't make sense anymore. Like there's tons of reasons for dropping off of the like top five in the country kind of scale. Yeah. And I mean, I use the phrase like the curve a lot in high performance sports, there's usually some sort of curve right like you expect people will win junior world championships and then move forward right so at some point you're off that curve what i'm saying is like you know if you start late you're not on the curve we have examples of people that have at the age of 20 or 25 or 30 you know they've come from maybe another sport or just they're phenoms and they've come into the sport they've worked really hard and they've gotten back onto the curve they've won something you know they won world championships Mm -hmm. at the age of 30 and they had never done anything they came in nowhere those are you know outliers um malcolm gladwell book you can read about this um but for a lot of the rest of us you know the reality is we're not doing that so the question is why do we train you know do we continue training do we quit training you know or quit racing quit racing Um, why are we riding bikes or running or doing any of these things? And so that ultimately gets to what is your why? And for most of the clients I work with uh, at Smart Athlete and really the the philosophy, the the naming, I guess, of Smart Athlete is that you have these people who, you know, they're smart people. They have jobs, they have families, they're busy. um, They're doing lots of stuff. And sport is, you know, a part of that because, you know, you need to balance yourself out. I think it was actually my arch nemesis, Andrew Watson, told me this one <laughs> concept of like, we don't run from tigers anymore. I think he stole this, but I'll, I'll attribute definitely it definitely stole that. You know, so what are you going to do, right? Like you, you could certainly sit on the couch and go to your work and type on your computer and, you know, I guess play with your kids and have a fulfilling life in that, that respect. 
Um, but at some point, you know, you need to scare yourself and do some scary stuff and push your limits in some way, right? Again, sometimes work does that. Sometimes I imagine kids do that. Um, but you need to be pushing yourself forward, right? Uh, so for some people, sport or, or training or activity is a, is a great way to do that. Mm-hmm. So why don't you, like for you, you, you've been sort of even battling with this a little bit. You have raced elite. In, in some sports, cyclocross, you're, you're pretty good at triathlon. I was but say, we're putting like a hardcore quotation mark around that, especially when we're talking about cyclocross. But yeah, like with triathlon, there there were points where I could have gone all in on it and, you know, done the pro thing, elected not to. But it's it's definitely been like a weird back and forth with why am I racing? What am I doing? I mean, this summer alone is sort of a good example. I jumped in some road racing because I got peer pressured into it. Uh, Shout out to the wonderful people who peer pressured me into it. I love them very much. Um, So I jumped into some of that. I, you know, did my first little ultra distance race for running. I just jumped into some cyclocross and gravel stuff. And all of it kind of made me think really hard about the why am I racing? Um, out of all of them, the one that I really enjoyed the most was the ultra running one. And I think that was 90%, probably 95% because I actually really enjoyed the training for it. Like right now running really long distances happens to be the thing that's making me really happy. So being able to train for the race was what was kind of, I guess the reason I wanted to do the race. I've I'm definitely more of a um, race to train kind of person. I need a thing on my calendar to make me get out and do the training, but ultimately the race itself doesn't matter as much as the training does. That's why we, I mean, I'd say that was true for us with Ironman last summer, right? Like we really only put that on the calendar so you would learn to swim and I had some kind of crazy thing to start training for. Yeah, and I, I think I, I always like to phrase this as point A, point B, which I've stolen from Dan John, uh, who's my favorite strength coach and has some really good books if you're looking just for strength training, which we're going to talk about strength training in our second question today. But a lot of his books uh, talk a bit about this. You know, you're not an NFL player making millions of dollars, so you need to take care of yourself. And, you know, he talks a lot about this, like, sport as part of life uh, and health. Um, so he talks about point A, point B. So you don't have that world championships. So you are here at point A. So where are you going? Mm-hmm. And trying to establish that where are you going, right? And and for a lot of us, that process, the, the line between point A and point B is is very important, right? You should enjoy that. That should sort of have something that's enjoyable and, you know, fits into your day as possible in your day, um, but pushes you and it's fun. So for with Ironman, Swimming was something that I wanted to become competent at and learn and be a beginner at and and sort of experience that day-to-day improvement that I no longer really get with cycling. Right. You know, I'm fairly competent. I do improve. There's still lots of things I can get better at, but it's, you know, invest 10 hours to get, you know, one tiny improvement Right. versus go to the pool once and, you know, boom, you know, I swim two more lengths comfortably or, wow, I swim noticeably faster doing something right so all that to say we want to pick goals then that motivate you know and do have a day-to-day that's fun for us right so the reason why we race is so that every day as you say it motivates training that's fun so you trained uh for a 50k run this year Mm -hmm. at the tail end of the year and that involved a lot of longer runs um and you can certainly do that type of training without a ton of intervals which you also don't really like really hate so for you, it was just a way that, okay, you go go run for an hour or two hours or, you know, even longer a couple of times. And that was enjoyable, but also yeah. pushed you. Right? Yeah, Because exactly. if when we don't have that on the calendar, you, you wouldn't do that, right? Like work's busy and, you know, you, you do need to sit here and write some books in the next little bit. It's true. So I think that's an important piece when we're looking at, well, what do we do now? You know, we're a young person maybe who's, you know, the dream's... I guess we could say dying. Wah, wah. This particular question did reference my dreams dying, yeah, uh, which geez. was nice. <laughs> um, but, you know, they, they have a insight into my life where I have my coaching business and that's become more and more important. Um, and, and it's just the reality is I'm not going to Olympics, right? 
Um, so how I work with that. And for this year, I guess my, I'll try and keep the example short, but I, I just really didn't want to race that much. I wanted to spend more time riding and riding with friends and, and training because I do enjoy training. Uh, and then just really focus on showing up and winning or doing really well. Again, at nationals, I wasn't expecting to win, but I was expecting to have like a best race. Mm -hmm. Um, and then provincials, I was expecting to show up and win. And and I had told people that I was going to show up and win, which is for me a big deal. And like, I was really amped and motivated going into our provincials. And it's not, it's really not that big of a deal, right? It's not world championships. No one's taking me anywhere. Um, but it's a win, right? And for me, that was winning at nationals, being able to race in the chase group for most of the race was a win. Yeah. Right. Um, and so that motivated a lot of fun training all year and motivated the some not so fun training that I hate doing, but need to do to be though in those groups, right? I hate doing really hard, short efforts and sprints and right. But that's how you race mountain bikes. Right. So all that to say winning just is in quotation marks and you have to decide what winning is for you. Yeah, Absolutely. And I think picking a type of racing that goes along with the training that you like to do. So, you know, what I learned this summer is, you know, road racing isn't really for me because I don't really like the training that goes along with it. And since I'm not really racing that much or my expectations around my racing are pretty low, like I was not road racing thinking like, oh, I'm going to win this race or like, you know, oh, I want to see if I can get on like a bigger and better team and go over and race in Europe. Like I have zero inclination to do that. Um, and I had zero inclination to want to do really hard intervals on my road bike. That just wasn't really a thing that was like lighting me up. Yeah. And I see a lot of it. You just tried a gravel race. Did you find gravel racing? No, not as much. You weren't as much into that. Well, gravel racing is a very tricky beast because like as a woman, especially like you end up in very odd packs of dudes Um, so it's an interesting thing. I enjoyed being out there. I think I would enjoy it more had I been a little bit more prepared for it. Like bearing in mind, I signed up for that pretty much like the week before. So we're going to, I'm going to hold off my judgment of gravel racing just because I had not really prepped for the fact that there was going to be right. a ton of elevation. It was like the longest ride I'd done in you, eight you, months. You often have trouble with your cycling training. Yeah, like, let's be honest, I love riding my bike, but I've never been the best person in the world at training on the bike. I've been good at putting in the volume I need to put in, but doing the actual hard efforts have never been a thing that's been super great for me. So, you know, racing like cyclocross, I love because I love the community and I enjoy being around the people. Do I actually love the racing itself? Not really, because I don't train appropriately for it. Right. And, And so... I guess I'm trying to think towards this question here that we have, um, you know, and getting to that, like, when do you say that it's enough and, and move on and do work or, you know, a family or do, you know, these different things that racing maybe is holding back from? I think it's when it's not fun anymore. I think, you know, this question also kind of referred to competition being almost like a drug, like you're almost addicted to the competition. And, you know, to me, I don't necessarily think of that as like a positive thing. Yeah. I know there's a lot of people who, you know, really love racing, but if you're feeling like it's, it's more of an addiction than a thing that you're actually just doing because it's fun and enjoyable. Like if you're coming home at the end of a race weekend and you're just miserable and you're not going into work on Monday feeling rejuvenated and like you had a really fun weekend. Right. To me, that's, you know, you need to take a break from racing and see sort of what happens when you just go out on, you know, a fun bike ride on the weekend where you're just playing. Right. And I think, you know, I tried to think through some of the different client examples because I find talking about myself is sort of, a different example sometimes or at least it feels conceited I guess but uh, so I mean I've had a couple of clients over the last few years who have been you know fighting to stay on that curve and then have stepped back to do school or family or whatever um, and again they they focused more maybe they're going to one or two high level races um, you know similar to how I went to nationals or whatever 
Uh, and they've tried to be fit when they got there and they've tried to plan their life. You know, I wrote an article, which I'll try and link to about like, you've set your goal, but can you actually do the process that that goal requires? So, I mean, the reality is, you know, if you're going to go and try and be the world champion, like that is an all encompassing, not necessarily even healthy pursuit, right? Peak performance is not the same as health. Um, so that could mean that you have to be very good at riding your bike or running or whatever your thing is, but very bad at relationships and working and developing skills at school or social skills or right. And I mean, I'll put myself the first person, you know, there's areas of my life that I've had to spend time on in the last few years for sure. Um, because of elite sport, right. And that's just that that's the definition of being elite and that's not for a lot of people. Right. So in Dan John's wording, like you're not an NFL player, so stop like bashing your head off of stuff and not taking care of your other buckets of life, right? Your other, you know, whatever relationships, work, family, you know, health. I thought you were in grids now, not buckets. I, I probably have several things going. So all that to say, I have a client who stepped back and he's won a bunch of different local races. He's had a great season. He's also a provincial champion of, of I won't say the discipline, but he won uh, a, a couple of titles, won a bunch of races, uh, tried a bunch of gravel stuff. He was coming from road. Um, and and I think he had a great year. And then he's also going to school, you know, for a, a post, what is that called? Post Post grad, post grad type program. So he's doing really high level stuff with that. Uh, lifestyle stuff is going really well. Yeah. So, I mean, his life is going well and bikes are still a part of it. And he's still, I think the fittest, definitely the fittest person I've ever coached. And one of the few people I ride with who, can make me feel like the worst cyclist ever. Um, like I've, I've PB'd three minute efforts with him on Hills and he has been like looking at me like I was the slowest person ever. So all that to say, you can be very good and keep improving. Like, I think the crazy thing for me has been his numbers have just gotten better this year and his volume is so much lower because he's not in down South training. He's Mm -hmm. been, he did Canadian winter. He's run a ton. So he's becoming a better athlete. And then we've been able to do really focused stuff that when you're down in California or wherever in the warm weather, you know, you can't do all these things. And it's, so it's funny sometimes giving up and becoming more balanced and more healthy and more, you know, you have a routine at home even. Yeah. Um, you know, you're happy. The happy athletes go faster or whatever the hashtag is. You know, sometimes it's surprising. Yeah. You know? And then you're winning because you've changed the, is that moving the goalposts? Uh you know, you actually start enjoying it a lot more. Mm-hmm. So that, that's maybe one example. It was a pretty vague example, but that was an example, right? Where, you know, you can do all this other stuff. So if you're holding off, you know, maybe on having kids or something like that because of sport, like, you know, there's lots of people that have kids and still race and still do amazing things. Um, if that's a hint, we're just going to have to pause I don't. I don't here. think I'm one of those people, but... <laughs> Um, those people always impress me with the amount of stuff they get done. I know, um, right? Yeah. So do you have, what else? What else on this? I'm thinking what here? Go. I just think it's okay to want to train and not race. Like, I think it's total. I think it's awesome to be just the super, like the fittest version of you. Not so you can maybe get top five or top 10 or win whatever race, just so you are the fittest version of you and you're happy like that. Yeah. And I mean, there's so many ways to quantify, like personal improvement is something that we do, you know, in business. That's, you know, the thing we have, there's lots of self help personal improvement books. Right. So, I mean, with power now, it's very obvious, you know, how numbers are going. The last example I just told, you know, we can see his numbers changing and maybe if it was a six hour road race, stage race, maybe he's not as quote unquote fit. But when we're going up a three minute hill or a 10 minute hill or the classic 20 minute effort, like he's fitter, this last athlete I was talking about, right? So yes, maybe not a six hour road racer fit, but I don't know if you even want to be that person, right? Like that's the special or the, the Tour de France cyclist is not going out running and not, you know necessarily a physical specimen, you know, in, in the traditional sense, right? Very fit for going up mountains and being a cyclist. Yeah. And I mean, I think the last thing to maybe add to this is, you know, there's a reason we started this podcast and titled it The Consummate Athlete. And it kind of started actually around when you were thinking about getting out of racing quite as seriously. And part of it was, you know, we're out with friends and they want to, 
you know, go do this four hour hike or, you know, oh, we have people that are doing this crazy run in the mountains or we have people that, you know, wanted to go like stand up paddle boarding. Um, so we really wanted to start this podcast for the sake of being able to jump into whatever activities were, you know, showing up around us. And that might not have fit in with a training plan for you when you were trying to be like, you know, super pro mountain biker, but they fit in, you know, really well now with where we're at. Yeah. And I think that that's sort of like the adventure and the social piece, yeah. right? And I think that's what's missing. You know, we can get into a, we're not going to talk about development of sport. We have a podcast with Scott Kelly where we do talk about that a bit. Um, but I think that's, you know, when you're in that elite mindset, like you have to do a lot of training alone, you have to do a lot of travel, um, you know, it, it can be isolating. And I think definitely this podcast was, you know, I think in the first episodes, if you listen to them and if you can bear through our, our early audio and so forth, um, we talk about that, that it's really, you know, we want to be out being able to do a, a group ride one day. You jumped into a gravel race and you were third, you got beer, you know, that's great. You had a good time. You survived, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you went on an adventure in the fine hills of Mono. Um, and then, you know, everyone hung out, right? And, you know, you, yeah, Jen, exactly. Jen Jackson was there. There was lots of, you know, people you met, um, new people that you met and people talking about Shred Girls. And so there was adventure. There was social. You were probably a little scared. You did a big workout. Um, you experienced some new roads. Um, you stayed active in the crappy fall weather. Uh, so there's a lot of side benefit and for you that was that was a huge win day right and there's like five buckets of of mm -hmm. things right you have adventure and community and a little bit of business you know because you sponsored the event too so there's all these things right so what winning becomes you know what's a good day at the races mm -hmm. right like what that sort of that sort of keeps growing um and I, I think the other thing for me you know this sort of again referenced my training, I guess. And the way I try and think about it, again, I, I had those two races that I showed up for. And so I think about the year in sort of, you know, this isn't revolutionary, but if we think about a consummate athlete periodization versus an elite athlete periodization, if we can trademark that. Ooh. So rather than thinking base and build for your cycling, we're going to think about, you know, this phase of training. I'm So July, maybe I was really, I had four, say four to six weeks to get ready for nationals. So I had to be riding my mountain bike, riding not my enduro bike as much, but my cross country race bike that I was going to race up hills really fast and being ready for, you know, a bit of altitude, bit of heat and some descending so that Evan Guthrie wouldn't embarrass me on the downhills this year again. I think he still did. A little bit. Uh, I did better though. So yes. winning for me, my times were better. All right. Um, so I had a focus. I had a block of four to six weeks. Anyone can focus for four to six weeks. But then what did we do in August? Uh, we were at the Ellen Noble Cyclocross Quest. So immediately we started focusing on cyclocross, but I had to do a video for cycle, two videos for cyclocross plus Ellen's Quest and also not embarrass myself riding and jumping onto a cyclocross bike, which I was moderately successful at. So then the focus changed to more cross and some cross training. You and I were actually running. You were getting ready for a 50K. Yeah. So I think I ran with you a fair bit, right? So the focus changed. I didn't even look at my mountain bikes in August. Um, and, and then I actually had to focus in somewhere in there for provincials, which is a whole other side story and cyclocross relates. But uh, if we use the mountain biking for July as an example, right? Uh, and then in the fall here, we've been very much just little blocks of running mostly and strength has increased and in my running I'm doing at least 15,000 steps so now I'm doing sort of a more I guess you could call polarized like four days of strength huge walking you know and not nearly as much riding and running right now mm -hmm. um, so I just try and think about the year in those phases and I think someone could do the same thing you know race a bit of cyclocross maybe if you want to run or road season or early spring races and, and try and build in those periods where it's lower key, right? Yeah, absolutely. General preparation. Yeah. Well, and that kind of leads very nicely into our next question, which kind of goes to that general preparation strength training thing, which is just how do you strength train as an endurance athlete in the off season? Now, we've talked a ton about the importance of strength training. That's all great, but we haven't really ever gone into like exactly how we strength train or how an endurance athlete should strength train and set up a strength training session. Uh, and this is a huge thing for me in the past year, you know, between honestly learning how to do a, a warm up for strength training. I'll, I'll admit like 
I've been the person who walks into the gym and just like looks at what machines are there, what, you know, what weights are there and whatever, and just randomly sort of does a few cir- like loops. I'm not even going to call it circuits because that's not even like a fair statement. Like literally just kind of bounced from machine to machine, just kind of picking and choosing random weights, random work, like exercises and you know that worked fine when i was in my 20s and had zero strength training so anything was good um but obviously as i get older and want to focus in and have a better strength training program things like warming up well actually having circuits potentially writing down what weights i'm doing has become much more important so yeah Yeah. and uh, so dan john i will say again so the book is easy strength and if you're not amped and have like a, some sort of plan to, to use from that, uh, I would get that book. Uh, and it talks a lot about the basics of strength training. So let's start off with a very, uh, I guess, general description. So in a strength training, if you were just like Molly, you were going to go and start trying some strength training, you want to really warm up. You, you know, you can do whatever. I always have people do some sort of cardio just to sort of mostly to get them to empty their head from whatever they were just doing. Um I'll usually watch them do it and just see, are they moving slow or fast? But just get the heart, the blood moving a little bit. I'm going to say, especially in the winter, this is important when everyone's just very, like, actually cold. Yeah. Or literally warm. So if you muscles. row for a couple minutes or something, that's going to be more full body. Um, usually we'll use the rowers or, or something like that. People r- run outside in the summer, but again, it's warmer, so it's not really that big a deal. Uh, but just very, very gentle. Um and again, being careful if you have any any issues. And then we'll do some sort of active mobility, which really just means you're doing strength training type movements without weights generally, right? So you'll do some lunging, some squatting. You'll maybe do some, you know, plank type stuff. So I really like inchworm. You'll maybe do some therapy type stuff. We use a lot of, say, wall slides or different like band pull-aparts would be another exercise. Um, but just sort of, you know, arm swings, leg swings, do a couple squats, you know, get a broom handle and put it over your head and do some squats. Um, lunging is very classic active mobility. Um, you know, you could do some skipping or something in part as part of that to get some coordination, a little bit of jumping, and again, keep the sort of heart moving. And then you can get into your strength. So a strength training, generally you're going to want to check the boxes of uh a push and pull for the lower body, which would be, so push would be like a squat, any of the squat variations. So a goblet squat would be the way we often start squatting. So you hold a dumbbell or a kettlebell at your chin, and then you squat up and down. So it'd be like sitting on a chair, holding a weight at your chin, goblet squat, okay? The pull would be a deadlift or hip hinge type motion. So that could be, you could be deadlifting. There's trap bar deadlifts, there's suitcase deadlifts using like big kettlebells Uh, you could do kettlebell swing would be you know again sort of advanced but some people do that Uh, what else could we do for hip hinge i mean you could certainly just do a hip hinge like a one leg deadlift we often do a lot as an intro so something like a romanian one leg deadlift i'll also pause and say what i really like about this whole different like there are several different motions is you could make a grid of these yeah, I think it's... And then just choose your own adventure, basically, and just kind of with whatever you have on hand at the time. And or... I have a few clients that are a little like yourself, where they that's what they do. I've sort of given them... So there's, again, I'll finish this, but there's six, basically. So lower body push-pull, and then there's an upper body horizontal push-pull. So that would be a row or in a push-up, okay? And so TRX row, bent over row, and a push-up or a chest press. That's horizontal push-pull. And then you're going to have a vertical push-pull. So that's a pull-up and an overhead press, okay? Um, And there's a million different variations of all six of those. Dan John, and I think well-founded, would add a heavy carry, so putting two heavy weights in your hands and carrying them around the room, which sounds odd, but it's really good. And then crawling of some type. So that might be like a bear crawl, crab walk, um, you know, and there's less maybe kooky things that you could do that are similar to that, you know, a push-up or a plank with, you know, doing some sort of planking even might qualify. Uh, but those are Dan John's sort of additions to that. But in most textbooks of strength training, you'll see those sort of six key push pulls. Yeah. So what we tend to do is two circuits of three of the moves each. 
Yeah, I really like to keep people moving. I mean, as you get into like a, a more focused strength thing, you, you might only do squats and then like sit down or, or do mobility or something for, you know, a bunch of minutes between. But that's a, a more advanced thing. And most people just aren't there. And then again, Dan John is fond of saying anything works for six weeks. So you could just do blocks of things. Um, but yeah, we, I, I like to group sort of three or four exercises in. And so that might be like, what would we do? Squat, maybe a push up, TRX row. And then maybe we do something like a, a one foot balance or a little hop or, um, you know, usually there's like a fourth sort of kooky thing that's not as hard and provides a little extra recovery. So we can come back to the focus thing, which is usually the squat or the deadlift. And that gets you through again, Molly says two to three sort of circuits basically, right? Or mini sets of, of three to four exercises, two to four exercises. Exactly. So our basic, I'll, I'll say like our workout outline in general would be warm up about 10 minutes and then two circuit sets of, yeah, same like three to four of those exercises done three to four times in a, in a circuit. Mm -hmm. And then you go on to the next circuit. That's the other three of those six exercises. Right done again three to four times in that circuit and then we do what well, te we tend to do a heavy carry plus a crawl as sort of our finisher yeah yeah and, and that again depending on the time of year or the workout or what else we have on in the day if you know it's sort of the way like it is now and we're sort of just trying to stay active between work and the weather uh, it might be more i guess metabolic so we might get breathing harder whereas during cycling season neither of us needs more quote-unquote cardio right so we're not going to go crazy with how fast and how vigorous that is but we still will pick up something really heavy and walk around with it working on grip strength and sort of total body strength and we'll still get down and probably crawl you know maybe pull a sandbag while we're crawling or something I hate that. but we'll just sort of grind through it right so we'll spend a lot of times i'll just be like five minutes and we're just going to keep rolling through right so i'm trying to think what we did the other day we that we had the same deadlift sort of we had a trap bar loaded up same weight for both of us because you're very strong. Hooray! And so I would carry it to one end of the room, oh, at, right? And then you, yeah. you, I think you were bear crawling or crab walking. I don't remember what we were doing, but we were crawling. So the other person had to crawl sort of beside the person carrying the heavy weight. And then we would switch. And then the other, so Molly would carry the heavy weight back across the room and then I'd have to crawl. So it was sort of like a, I guess a fun, they call that a couple's workout. But, you know, that adds a little bit of fun, right? And that's always the thing is people want this like, entertainment during strength because if i just said you need to squat and push and pull it sounds boring right boring works but not everyone will show up every week if you keep it boring yeah i think i'm actually a really big fan of the like strength training buddy as long as you can be like cool about the weights you use i admit i'm kind of a jerk yeah definitely <laughs> If Peter can do something, I immediately want to lift it, bench it, deadlift it, whatever. Um, so I need to constantly kind of remind myself it's okay if I'm not lifting the same weight. Um, but that's definitely my huge detriment. So I, I'll say like my, my warning to people is strength training with a buddy makes it a lot more fun. But it's also really easy to fall into a really negative competition that's just going to end with you pulling something in your back. Well, and the reason I recommend, like, A, D any of Dan John's books are amazing and will get you amped to strength train. Um, but Easy Strength is a really neat... We did this one year, um, one of my friends and I, when we were down in California in training, we'd go to the gym, not every day, but Easy Strength is basically this concept that you go do the uh, essentially the routines we're talking about. Maybe you pick, like, a focus for each session, I think is how Easy Strength works. So it might be a little abridged. So it might be, like, a 20 or 30 minute workout, but you're basically doing something most days. Um, so one day you might focus and do, you know, the mini set we were talking about for squats and pushes. And then the next day you might come back and do a mini set for the pulls. Mm -hmm. Um, but you're just, it's, it's called easy strength because you're not really pushing that hard, but mm -hmm. every week or every session, even you're bumping it up. So for a lot of people who are newer to strength, especially this works so well and is so safe. So a lot of years, that's how I'll do my, my first six weeks of strength training is I'll just start super light. So yesterday I did five by five front squat at 65 pounds. And for me, moving quickly and smoothly is pretty tough. So I, that's what I'll also try and do in this early phase is just get smooth and work at any kinks from mountain biking too much over the summer. Um, 
and, and just try and really get smooth. So this week, 65. Next session might be even even like a, a very small increment, but call it five pounds more. So next week will be 70, right? And it sounds like, oh, geez, that's really light. But come back in six weeks or 12 weeks, right? And that gets, now we're up over my body weight on a front right. squat, right? And most people can't even hold a bar or front squat, right? Because of the shoulder mobility and the core required to hold that upright. Mm-hmm. So starting slow and getting in next time is that's really your mission with strength training. Yeah. I think my other pitch is just body weight training. Like people sure. tend to kind of just assume that it's not really as hardcore, but you can do so much with body weight. We actually have a couple of videos for different routines that you can do. We call it anywhere strength. And this is great if you don't have access to a gym all the time, if you travel a bunch, if you know, you're just kind of stuck at home more and you can't necessarily get out and spend that time going to the gym. You can do so much with body weight. Like I did that yesterday and I'm sore today, like as sore as I would be if we'd gone to the gym. Yeah. And I would say, I mean, part of this strength training conversation is it would be good if you could maintain that year round, like the evidence, even for like peak performance is quite good for endurance sports, especially, or not especially, but as well, like you would maybe not think that. And a lot of times people are like, oh, stop strength training before your big event. The evidence doesn't necessarily show that like there's actually really good evidence for maintaining the intensity like the weight of the strength training and just dropping the volume in season in competition phase so it would be good if you could continue that now keeping summer sports athletes indoors is very hard in the summer uh, and we all only have so much time so I've had pretty good success keeping people going with this 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes while your coffee's cooking, 10 minutes while you're cooking dinner, 10 minutes before bed, wherever it fits, 10 minutes as a cool down from riding or a warm up for riding, right? Uh, and, and so as Molly says, the anywhere core thing we'll link to, you can search that on YouTube as well. Uh, and then Molly has your yoga too. I know a few clients have used that as their main focus and ultimately it's movement right in your yoga thing there's planking there's probably some Mm -hmm. lunging you know just by nature of doing yoga and for a lot of people yoga actually probably is the better way to go after some of this movement training because they're so high intensity in everything they do right i'll tell you too some of the so i teach teen yoga over at active life on mondays and we were just joking about it yesterday but holding your arms just out for warrior two is a really hard thing for a lot of people to do it's actually hard to keep your arms straight out to your sides for any length of time we have to keep swooping our arms in for for some of the girls yeah it's funny i th- always think of my grade four teacher we had to go for gym class back when there was gym class at school there's not gym class at school Nah, they cut that stuff all back like there's some limited thing but that's always the big complaint is that they've limited physical activity for kids at school which is unfortunate um, but she used to always have us do these like arm circles. So if you like put your arms out, like you're at the letter T at the side yep. of your body, right? And she would make us like make the tiniest circles with our palms up and then our palms down. And I just remember being like crushed. And that was like our warm up. Like it was part of just like that the routine. Is such a Jane Fonda, like early nineties workout video move. It's amazing. Yeah. And I, I don't know where it came from, but I like always, sure Jane Fonda. it could be, um, but I mean, I remember that being good. So I don't know whether that trained my like deltoid, like my shoulder muscles or, or what, but uh, probably some rotator cuff uh, help there too. But anyhow, all that to say, yes, L- finding those little things that, you know, are, are going to be helpful. And I, I always say that half the battle here is you're going to have kids jumping on you or you have to pick up those groceries or you're going to have to pick carry a suitcase through the the airport um, or you're going to fall off your bike or off the trail when you're running and your arm's going to go over your head violently and if you never put your arms over your head at all whether it's for Jane Fonda moves or not you're going to have like a rotator cuff collarbone some sort of injury low back strain from the kid jumping on you right and and that's why you're doing all this ultimate it's not to increase power or how fast you run or you know any of this stuff that happens though just in case you're the kind of person that's like ah kids jump on me all the time and i'm fine yeah you will also see benefits to your like training for sure but i i think the sales pitch is that you'll be able to get faster if you believe that running more will make you faster you'll be able to run more because you won't be at home with a low back strain from picking up legos off the the ground good point right 
All right, on that note, we're going to link to a bunch of other episodes about strength training in the show notes so you can kind of catch up on that. We even just talked with uh, Jen Jackson about what strength training she does to get ready for cross-country skiing. So if that's in your wheelhouse or on your plans for this winter, definitely listen to that one. Yeah. Um, yeah. We have a bunch of other mobility and strength. The Jacques DeVore cycling one is a a big hit. Everyone really enjoyed that one, so that one's good. Uh, Yoga, we had Aaron Taylor. Yep. Uh, on we had Robert Hertz talking about powerlifting, mm-hmm. which was really good. That's traditional sort of strength training. Everyone liked that. We had my personal favorite, Katie Bowman, on talking just about movement and walking. But she does a lot of therapeutic exercise. So if you do have anything like foot pain, um, just different pains around your body, she has a lot of really good content, and we talk about some of that. Uh, similarly, Brad Cox was on talking about acumobility and some of the sort of soft tissue stuff you can do for yourself. And Steve Neal was on talking more specifically about integrating cycling and strength training. Perfect. So we'll try and link to all those. But if you look up any of those things on our podcast uh, website, consummateathlete.com, or just put that into the Google engine with consummateathlete.com, I'm sure you'll find something of interest. Awesome. Thanks, as always, for listening. If you've enjoyed this, please do us a solid and rate and review. And we will see you next time. Thanks so much for tuning into the Consummate Athlete Podcast. Uh, You can check out my stuff over at theoutdooredit.com or by following me on Instagram and Twitter at Molly J. Herford. And you can check out Peter's coaching, training plans, blogs, all that fun stuff over at smartathlete.ca or by following him on Twitter and Instagram at Peter Glassford. And if you want to support this show and other awesome podcasts, please check out WideAnglePodium.com for show info, other podcasts, bonus content, and to become a donating member so you can get all of that rad behind-the-scenes content and help keep shows like this on the air. And lastly, if you're enjoying this podcast and all the information that we're bringing to you every single week... Uh, Do us a solid and pop into iTunes to leave us a rating and review. It takes you about two seconds. You can do it on your computer. You can do it on your phone. And it really helps us out. Thanks so much, and we will see you next week.